Dick Justin, uh, I'm a decoy carver. I spent uh, quite a few years at the seaport down here carving and, and, and had a good time. Um, here's some of the work I had, and some of the articles that were written about me, and, and some of the fun we had, had while we were working down here. I was born in 1942 in Perth Amway, New Jersey. Well, I obviously went to school there, went to Monmouth College, graduated as a chemist and worked for DuPont in, in a paint plant in Cerebral. Uh, we made paint for Ford and General Motors, and when you talk about making paint, uh, an average batch was probably 3,000 gallons, and the batches were 10,000 gallons, and, you know. And it had to be good stuff or I'd get a cold in the middle of the night or on the weekend saying it's not working and I had to go back into work because I was the head of the laboratory and make sure that they, uh, you know, got sat a satisfactory project. Uh, well, after, after a while, uh, DuPont was slowly getting out of the paint business and they closed the plant in Cerebral. I got transferred to Philadelphia would just involve the basic quality programs to make improvements within the company if I saw there was an issue that needed to be, could be made better, you know, I would take advantage of it and make that issue. I also traveled a lot to the uh, individual paint plants to talk to those people to find out what their issues were because they're the people that, you know, did, you know made, made the money, so to speak. And then I guess finally they decided to close that side up and uh, I was offered a, a pension at the age of 58, which I took. And I bought a house down, I, made, I built a house down here. I, bought, I had bought a house down here for a summer home for $12,500 in the mid 80s. And the property ended up being worth a lot more. So we ended up building a, uh, our retirement home down here. You know, my grandfather had come to Manahawk and he was from Denmark. Uh, his best friend was a Mr. Tunnison who just lived in Perth Amboy, but decided to move down here and open a bait shop, which is across from the street. And when my grandfather came down, he didn't like sleeping in the attic. So he decided to buy a little bungalow next door and he paid $500 for the bungalow and I think $800 for the property. And when I built my house next to him in the 80s, I paid $12,500 for a property that probably worth well over a million dollars today. So. But that's how I got my interest. I, you know, I started being active. I loved to go clamming. And then when I was 14 years old, the people, friends of mine, we went duck hunting. So I said, I would like to try it. And I got my hunting license in those days you could get your hunting license through school. I was in high school and I took a hunting program. And then if you passed all the tests that they gave you, you'd get your paperwork to purchase and, uh, a hunting license. Well, I learned it on my own. I, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I had a friend there was two people, Harley Compton I went to see, because I wanted to learn, he's a famous old carver. He was not a very nice gentleman, so he didn't help me at all. I ended up going to a guy named Ruth Corliss who lived in Mount Hawk, and he was Babe Ruth's hunting guide. And uh, the first, first what, he, what he told me to do when I first got started, he said to take two pieces of cedar, you hold them out, glue them together, and then you carve your decoy and paint it. So I went home and said, Dad, do we have any uh, pieces of cedar? And we had a couple four by fours. So instead of doing it this way, I did it this way. And this is the bird right here that's done that way. And I took it to Ruben and showed it to him. And then I found out that I was the dumbest kid in the world. I didn't do a damn thing he told me to do. And uh, he wasn't very happy, but that's the last time I did this. This, this was the second bird I carved following Ruben's instruction, which looks like Ruben's birds, you know. And I carved a and then the hunt with. He was a hunting guide for the root, uh, Well, he was a hunting guide in general. Babe Ruth was one of his. Uh, in fact, there's a picture of Babe Ruth here, someplace at the seaport. The original picture that was taken years and years ago, and I'm sure it's probably worth a lot of money. 
But anyway, I got a copy of that picture at home. But when you think Babe Ruth, you know, was a very wealthy man and he came to Mount Hawkins, well, you know, everybody in Mount Hawkins would make something, probably some money on it. He, you know, would go out to dinner, rent a room, was known to have a beverage or two. Uh, so everybody in the hotel and the bars would make out. Before he went home, he'd probably fill his car with gas. So the guy in the gas station made out. So all these little, you know, that hunting was a, a, a rich man's sport, let's put it that way, back in the 20s and early 10s. It was like, that's what you did when you owned a business. You took people out hunting to impress them. And, and then, you know, and that's how, kind of how these little towns got started and got built up. You know, and, and most of these hunting guys or these pe wealthy people had houses out on these islands out there. There's still a few left, but not very many. These were used, uh, my first decoy was made for gunning. I hunted over them. Uh, they're very sturdy, they're very rustic and simple. I guess the philosophy was by the time the duck realized he made a mistake, he should be in the pot. These were made, I made a transition when I went to the uh, decoy show here in Tuckerton and I entered contests and I didn't do very good because there was people doing more decorative work at the time, which is artist work, so I learned by through learning through some friends of mine the different brushes to use, the different paints to use. There were two paints, not paints that were bought at Sears and Robux. Uh, like if you're trying to do a, a, a solid or one, just one color like the white or brown here, I would use a uh, oil-based paint. No, water-based paint because it dries faster. If you were doing decorative work, like putting little feather strokes in there, you use oil-based paints. That gives you time to work. Oil paint, paint dry probably in 24 hours instead of an hour. So it, that gives you time to work. And I, I, I know I've won over 50 plaques of best of shows and they're you know, on my walls at home. I guess it was the decoy show over here. You know, I never, you know, whenever I did this, I brought my first decoys to the decoy show and I did absolutely horrible. You know, and that's what changed my philosophy and some of the things we talk about, like being involved with the paint business, gave me a good concept of color, you know, and what colors and how to paint. You know, the process is, you know, I usually use wood two inches, two and a half inches uh, thick, and it depends on the decoy you're going to carve, anywhere from a smallest bird as a, a buffalo head, uh, you could get it six inches wide, probably the biggest bird you might want to hunt around here is a goose, which means you'd have to get at least 12 inches wide. Uh, there's a very few, there, there used to be a lot of cedar sawmills up in the pine barrens, uh, but cedar is not popular, it's very expensive, uh, a lot of government, uh, private land has been taken over by the government, so the, the resources are very difficult to find. There still is, that I know of, two people that do carve, I mean, do cut the wood. Uh, and if I was very, one of the guys is the guy that shows up at Tucker and, you know, decoy show, and, and, well, then when he's the guy that I would normally go to and pick out what I want and uh, go through that process. And I normally would, get probably 10 to 15 pieces of wood. He usually doesn't age it. He might age it for a few months. I usually age it for one or two years before I, else it, it does what you call a bleeding. You know, the sap is still in the wood. If you don't get the sap out of the wood, it'll, after you're done painting and you've got it all pretty up, it'll bleed right through all the paint and everything else. So you gotta make sure that you dry it out. So I, I still have a few pieces left. I have it on the rack in my garage, uh, but I haven't bought any for the last couple of years because I, I carve more small miniatures now than I do the big ones, you know, so. But yeah, I do most of my carving home in, in, in these little ones. It's uh, basically a exacto knife and a little piece of cedar like this that you cut out of a bandsaw 
and cut out the shape, the general shape, and then they just begin cutting away with the, with the carving knife, and when you get done, it becomes rough, what they call rough cut, and then you would sand it, and you know, you would sand it, and, uh, and then before, you know, it, it ends up something like this, which is just about done, and the next thing would be to glue the head on it, and the next thing would be to seal it, before you paint it and then give it a primer coat and a finish coat and then it ends up with something like looks at that little guy over there. You know, then there's some stories in between. These are uh, some work that the uh, department of, well, what was it? Fish and game departments were trying to do some study work on red nuts. And the issue was that they had to try to net them and the fact was that the, the tide in South America where they are, Southern Chile, the tide goes out and comes in two miles. So it's pretty hard to walk through that process and try to throw nets at them. What they do is we agreed at, at Seaport, we had four guys that were uh, carved a, a little, I think 20 or 25 birds for them to use as decoys and then when they, they could just sit on some ground like you would if you were actually hunting and they had a net that they actually shot over the birds and that's how they did their studies and they're still studying the red knots. They're very dependent on horseshoe crab eggs. They make their transition from South America, mostly Southern, very Southern South America all the way up to North America, far from here, another thousand miles from here, they go just to mate. And they change their colors from red knots. In the wintertime, this all turns white, it turns a different color. This is their, what they call their breeding colors. You know, the same thing, this is another, a, a little funny story, this is a, a great Tiscany. And this was done for Rutgers. Rutgers was do, doing some scientific work on some very important crops that were growing down in the Caribbean and the fact that uh, there was a certain bug that was eating all their plants and they decided that you know they were going to try to get something in there to start eating the bugs and they found out this particular bird which was native to the area uh, would eat the bugs and they, want, they wanted some decoys to capture the birds I guess and and I think they wanted to breed them because they wanted more birds to do more work. Then the birds got smart enough, they, f they found out instead of the bugs, they liked the fruit better than the bugs that they were trying to capture. So, so they canceled that project after they got the decoys, but it's like, it's kind of a funny story, that's all. The most important values I have is my daughter and my granddaughter. This is a picture of them. My daughter has done every decoy show since she was started. She actually learned how to carve decoys. She worked here at the Seaport too during when she was in college and I had taught her how to, you know, how to carve decoys and she did that. And she's gone to every decoy show with me and she just loves it. And that fact brings it to my granddaughter who's now 12 years old and uh, she loves it too. She had, I, I bought her her own table last year at the decoy show, and she made more money than I did through, through her little paintings. And she, she would actually, as a person, would stand, if you wanted something painted, you would tell her what you wanted painted, she'd tell you to come back in an hour. And it was painted, and she, you know, it was, it was kind of neat. My name is Noelle Petronani, and I'm his daughter. I'm Carla Petronani, and I'm his granddaughter. <laughs> Very early memories of, of decoys in the house and going to shows and um, I started going to shows with them and I used to make my little friendship bracelets and sell them on the side of the table and for 25 cents and people would buy them and I got excited and um, then I would every year I would go to the show and enjoy it a lot and then I would watch my dad um, even at home and paint and carve and I and I just it piqued my interest and I was hmm, maybe, you know, can I try that dad like 
and you know he's like sure so we tried a little bit of sanding and a little bit of carving and I started making a few decoys so um, that was really exciting exciting for me um, and yeah just my, my friends would love to come down it was very different very different from from other families other other dads and the fishing and the crabbing we said one of the best memories I have as a, as a child and doing all that you know when, like a funny memory is because my dad would hunt also and he would have the the ducks in the freezer so I would open up the freezer to get something and there'd be a duck in the freezer and you know that's like normal for me so um, yeah it was a lot of great memories I could go on uh, what about you? Yeah, I love to go to the duck show. It's really fun to like make all the different things and like the bracelets and paint pictures of like ducks and all that. And I like to go fishing and like crabbing with Poppy and like to drive the boat to mm -hmm. places. So that's fun. Yeah, we would go out crabbing. You know, I remember with my brother and my dad and, and my uncle Ray and we'd have teams and you know we'd have a contest of who can get the most crabs and I would go fishing tournaments with my dad and bring my friends and yeah so we did a lot a lot of stuff together. Um, I just really spend most of the summer I make bracelets, I paint lots of like the seashells and like paint canvases of a lot of duck stuff. She's an artist, she loves to paint, she does birds and even just um, nature scenes, you know, you know, of the ocean or the sky or sunsets and, you know, growing up and even, you know, as an adult, it's just, people don't appreciate and understand the time and the effort and the talent that goes into this art. And it's a lost art and when you go to these shows and you see his awards and you see um, just the detail, it's just amazing and I wish it was, it was more appreciated and you know all the, the awards he has and the Bayman's award from a couple of years ago and you know I always I tell people he's, fam he's famous, he's famous, he's absolutely famous for what he does and you know it's just not appreciated enough you know so yeah it's awesome. We're very proud of them. My name is Christian Petronani, and I like to say a few words. <laughs> and my grandfather loves fishing and crabbing and going out in the sea to fish. He does the best ducks. He makes the best ducks ever. And most of his medals are first or second place. He is my favorite person alive. Whoa. I'm Carlotta Jessen, the wife of Richard Jessen. <laughs> We've been married for 50 years. <laughs> That's a pretty long time. <laughs> We've had a lot of ups and downs, but we're still together. <laughs> and we met 50 years ago. Actually, I met him on another date. I was on a date with somebody else, and I said to one of my girlfriends, oh, this guy came in, and they called him Mark Trail, <laughs> because he liked, you know, to, to, kept, to go fishing. And, and a few months later, I, I, I was out with my girlfriends, and I met him again. And I says, oh, I remember, you know, I, I was on a date with so-and-so. And, -so and and from that day on, it was May the 6th, 1970. Mm -hmm. I can still remember the date. Oh, with me. <laughs> we, we started dating every week, and we got engaged the following Christmas, that Christmas. And we've been married for 50 years, so. <laughs> it was an older home that his grandfather built. When he came from Denmark, he was a carpenter and he built a lot of homes in Perth Amboy, so my husband said, would it be okay if we live here for a couple of years, we can save some money to buy a house? And I said, that's a great idea. So that's what we did. We lived in Perth Amboy <laughs> for a couple of years, and then we ended up buying a home 
in Freehold. And we lived there for seven years. And my husband worked for DuPont and they transferred him to Medford, New Jersey. And we lived there for 19 years. And here we are back down here in Manahawken because his parents and his grandfather, I should say, um, had a little bungalow in Manahawken that he bought in 1927. <laughs> and uh, we've been here since because my husband loves the bay and he loves fishing and crabbing. And I knew that when I met him. He was, my girlfriends would say, you're going out in the boat with him and the waves? And I go, because I was all dressed up, you know, like real <laughs> And we just hit it off, you know, so it's, it's been a, a wonderful ride. <laughs> I went to a lot of the shows with him. I mean, I did, I used to go with him and stay with him, you know, for a while and, and help him, you know. But I love the decoy shows because I would go around and I'd buy things. There were a lot of nice, you know, People there selling different things. Christmas. It was. It's different today than it was years ago when he went. Plus, he was involved in Ducks Unlimited, so we. He had a lot of meetings, and there were a lot of beautiful dinners with Ducks Unlimited that we went to. So we really enjoyed that. And then our daughter, of course, when we had children, our daughter got not our son, but our daughter got very involved with with the decoys and carving the decoys. She went and she took classes, right? I remember, and she carved some decoys. So she got really involved with her dad with that. But we were all there as a family. You know, the three of us, I should say. His grandfather bought that house in 1927 and it's still the same house. You know, we were thinking about having it torn down, but I guess we decided to have it raised and it's, it's been upgraded and remodeled, but it's still the same, the same house. But he has a lot of roots here, so that's why we're here, because he, yeah, he's always loved it down here. Our, our son lives in Atlantic City, but he comes every week, and that's not too far away. And our, our daughter lives up in Marlton, in the Medford area. That's where we lived for 19 years. Like, so they come, they come just about every, every week unless they have plans to do something. So we're very lucky that our children are close by, and not only that, that they come visit us and spend time with us, which is, really makes us feel good. <laughs> On our, it was, it might have been our first or second date, my husband said, we're gonna go to the shore for the day. So he picked me up, and I had this beautiful white outfit on, I was all dressed up, and I thought we were going on the boardwalk somewhere, maybe seaside or whatever. And we drive down to Manahawkin. I never even heard of Manahawkin. <laughs> okay. And we pull up and he had this little Garvey boat. And a friend of his, I think, came too with us. And we got on the boat and we went fishing. I never fished in my life. <laughs> I caught all the fish. I caught all these blowfish. It was May. I'll never forget the blowfish. And then I caught a weak fish. That's right, I caught a weak fish. And they're all looking at me like, and my husband says, yeah, I'm going to go. When we get back, I'm going to have it weighed because you might get something <laughs> for this fish. So I caught all the fish that day. But he couldn't believe it. So from that day on, I guess, that's why we're still together. <laughs> and we did go out a lot in the boat after that. I went out with him a lot in his little garby. We got caught in a violent thunderstorm. I'll never forget this. <laughs> it was awful. We ended up on some island. I don't know where we were, right? Yeah, yeah, wait, north. He yeah. still doesn't know where we were. <laughs> it was thunder, lightning, and then we got back in the boat. And after that, he says, he said to me, he says, you know, after that day, I knew I was going to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> Because I went through all that with him, and I mean, I was just like this, what should I say, I would always dress up, and I was always like neat and perfect, and here I am with, my girlfriends go, you're with that guy? They're going, <laughs> going out like fishing and doing all this stuff. <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I, says, I, I don't know how I'm doing it, but I'm doing it. <laughs>
as you can see, I have a variety of here. And part of the painting process is making sure that you have the right color of the bird. And uh, part of my experience has been uh, at one time when I worked for DuPont, uh, we made automotive car paint. Now we made this in usually a 3,000 gallon batch, could go up to 10,000 gallons and they would ship that to Ford or General Motors which they would paint the car was. In the process you used, you would load a batch of paint, you would spray it on a panel and you would have a standard of what the customer wanted and then you would have to make additions of colorants to make sure the customer got what he wanted. Once he did that, then we'd approve the batch, fill it out, and ship it to the customer, Ford or General Motors, which they put on the cars. And that knowledge or tradition is the same philosophy of how you uh, paint a decoy. If you have, I guess I have it here in my files, and for, I guess, each decoy, I've saved over the years a variety of of pictures to use as a guide. This would be what the standard would be uh, like a customer and I would take these pictures I would mix what I think was the right paint and I'd put it up next to it make sure it matched. These are ducks that are completed some of them have been entered you know obviously they have ribbons on them there's brand up there there's two first and best of shows uh, there's a, you know, a variety of, I don't know if you can see the miniature ducks over here. That's also a, uh, another type of contest. And I, I think one year, I, I've won the contest, at one time, 10 years in a row, I took first, second, and third place, all three, three prizes. So while I'm working on some, yeah, some of these, uh, and I haven't picked out these I've already made this year and I'll pick out the ones that are, are left because I'll be selling them in between now and the show so I'll pick out the ones I think is the best at the time of the show and then I'll enter those into the contest. And I like this one doesn't have a ribbon yet on it you know but hopefully I can get one this year. Uh, it's a wood duck. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. It's pretty nice very decorative you know it's a, you know it's not a, a working decoy a working decoy it, and the show is more like one you would use for hunting it's a simpler paint job it's got a they put it in the water and they put it in upside down and if it doesn't turn right side up it gets disqualified there's a, a little piece of lead in the bottom that stabilizes this and and you know when they put it in the water make sure it, it turns right side up i guess after i'm gone like I guess my daughter and my grand granddaughter will only be using them till they run out of the show. I think they really enjoy the show as part of their life. I mean, they, you know, they and you know, little Christian loves it too. He just has a good time running around and playing, and you know. the 40th anniversary of the decoy show. Uh, displaying my tables, trying to make a few bucks. I just entered the contest over there and won best of show for uh, Delaware River Birds. So I'm having a good show. Scoter, uh, Mallard, this is the bird of the year. That's what they're, uh, that's not from this year. I didn't enter that in the contest. I probably should have. Uh, and there's some other displays over here. Miniatures are up there. A lot of people don't have the room for the bigger birds, so they uh, like to take a little, the little birds and they can put them any place they want. Tide, you can see the post. And, and if you look across the meadows over there, there's a little... And then when I met him, I should have said this in the video. This 
said, you want to see my decoys? <laughs> And that's all I need to tell you.